May the God of all hope, may the God of truth, may the God of compassion and mercy be yours today. May you experience his mercy and grace as we worship and hear his word today. In Jesus' name, amen. You are going to hear today a message that most likely will challenge you. It challenges me. You are going to hear a, me a message that could even cause you to be a little nervous and maybe even scared, but that's okay. You will hear a message that may make you feel somewhat inadequate. I hope I haven't scared you away yet. <laughs> Bear with me. It's interesting. When our kids are little, we teach them a very little so a song that's very simple. You all know it. It's called This Little Light of Mine. I'm going to let it shine. I'm going to let it shine all around the neighborhood. I'm going to let my light shine. I'm not going to hide it under a bushel. And I'm going to let it shine till Jesus comes. Have you ever noticed that kids sing that with fervor? And the older they get, the less that song is born out in their lives. And let's admit it, the older they get as they get into adulthood, the less that song shines out in our lives. Last week, we... I gave a sermon called, It's Time to Gather and Scatter. And we talked about the fact that we gather to worship and fellowship and learn as a church family. We also talked about the fact that for many years, the church, not just Adventist church, but the church in general, has had an attraction model to win people to Jesus, to bring people in from the world. And people would come. They'd come to meetings, they'd come to VBS, they'd come to evangelistic series. But that's not happening near as, nearly as much anymore. And really, in reality, what it's forcing us to do is to really take the Great Commission seriously. Because what Jesus said in the Great Commission was not go to a far land. He said, in your going, wherever you go, as you go, in your home, in your neighborhood, in your workplace, even in the grocery store. In your going, make disciples. How do we do that? How do we do that? I think the scripture that was just read has some, some principles for us. And let me just give you a quick background. Paul is defending his ministry to the Corinthians. People were undermining his ministry. Oh, that happens in church? Yeah. People were undermining his ministry, and Paul was sitting there and saying, listen, I'm going to defend the fact that God has called me to preach. And so in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 5 and 6, notice what he says. He says, our message is not about ourselves. It is about Jesus Christ as the Lord. We are your servants, Jesus, for his sake. We are your servants, he says to the church at Corinth, for his sake. We are his servants because the same God who said let, that light should shine out of darkness has given us light. And for that reason, we bring to light the knowledge about God's glory, which shines from Christ's face. I, I want you to notice what he's saying in this passage. First of all, he reminds us that if we are going to be his servants our message is going to be it's about Jesus and not about us. It's about how Jesus comes across, not how well we come across. It's about pointing to him and not pointing to ourselves. Secondly, I want you to notice, he says that when we make our message about Jesus, he says what we're going to do is that we are going to bring light into darkness. Now, I firmly believe that Paul was kind of reminding people of the story of creation here. Because it was, the world was, out, was dark and without form and void, and God said, let there be light. 
And sometimes people argue about, well, how can there be light if there's no sun, moon, and stars until the fourth day? Maybe the light that God was talking about was the light of his presence at the beginning of creation. I think what Paul is saying very subtly is if you're going to talk about spiritual reality and people experiencing spiritual life, the same God who created this world by his presence and brought light to shine on the darkness is the same God who can make light shine on the darkness of people's lives. He goes on. He says... God said, let light shine out of darkness, has given us light. For that reason, we bring light, we bring to light the knowledge about God's glory. I think primarily he's not talking about the glory in terms of an aura or in terms of shine. He's talking about the glory of God in terms of his character. The glory of God in terms of who he is. And so he says, God shines his light in us as we gain more knowledge about him, as, as Michael prayed about, and as we gain more knowledge about him, we experience and get to know the glory of God, his character. But then he says something else, that that light sh- uh, shines from Christ's face. It's the idea of, of Christ's person. It shines in the person of Christ, but it's also this idea. I was at my grandson's first grade to pick him up, and I noticed something, and now I notice, know why I noticed it. As, as the parents were picking up their first graders and their kindergartners, oh, hi, how are you? It's good to see you. Yay! When was the last time you picked up a junior high kid that way? <laughs> when was the first time you picked up a junior high kid that way? And then they get into high school and college, and then it's all about, did you do your homework? What's going on? Are are you being good at school? And we wonder why kids kind of wonder sometimes if parents really care. Not all kids. Do you get my point? What, What would happen if we got and made people aware that God is just as excited about being involved in their lives as a first and second grade kindergarten uh, parent who's got kids in first and second kindergarten at being there to greet them at school or having them come home and greet them. I want you to think about that. I mean, very honestly, we have a hard time smiling in church. We have a hard time even praising God sometimes. We just... And so, in this passage, while Paul is defending his own ministry, he's reminding them, and he's reminding us of this principle, that God shines his light of truth into our hearts so that we can know him and love him and acknowledge who he is for one purpose. And then the last phrase, it's not the last phrase, it says he shines in our light and he's given us light to bring to knowledge the knowledge about God, to light, I'm sorry, let me reread that. For this reason, we bring to light the knowledge about God's glory. We bring to light. Most Bible translations, most commentators believe that's talking about God bringing to light in our own lives. But I think it's a dual thing. As God brings the light of his presence and glory into our lives, it's to shine out from us, to bring light and glory, his glory to other people as well. He doesn't stop there. In 2 Corinthians 4, 7, he says this, but we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. Paul's saying as we become, receive the light of God, the knowledge of God, and as we share the light of the knowledge of God with others, he says we become jars of clay holding a treasure. Now, the jars of clay in Bible times, those were the common jars that were used to do the menial tasks, to store food, the menial tasks of holding water to clean the house, the menial tasks of of being your store box where you store things. But it was also something else. It was often used to hide whatever money you might have 
or whatever uh, thing that you hold, held dear, whatever treasure you had in your house that you didn't want somebody to steal. And so this dual metaphor that Paul uses, we are jars of clay. We're just, in our common rut and routine of life, we, we are jars of clay. We're, we're nothing spectacular in and of ourselves. I'm sorry for those who think we should tell people that we're really spectacular, but that's not how the Bible portrays us. He goes on to say, and we are jars of clay who hold a treasure. What is the treasure? The treasure goes back to what he says in the previous verses. The treasure is the light of the knowledge about God's glory, which shines in the face of Jesus. So many times I hear Christians saying, well, I don't have many skills, or I'm not, I don't have much to offer God, or I don't have much that I can do to, to help people. This morning, I want you to know, while every single person here may be a jar of clay, if you have Jesus in your heart, you have a treasure. You are blessed. You are blessed. But I want you to notice one more thing. If you think about the fact that God's to shine in our hearts so that we can shine out to others, he reminds us that if we're going to shine out to others, we'll only be able to do that, not because of the power we have, not because of our great intellectual skill, not because of our great speaking skill, if we have that, not because of, of any other talent we might have, but because of the sur all-surpassing power of who? Of who? Of God. He provides the power. So the question now becomes, how do we shine out to others in the world in which we live? We, we need to be aware that for many years, most of our evangelism has been bringing people into the church who are already Christians from other faiths. We just got them to change sheepfolds. We brought very few people in who didn't know Christ before. It does happen. I can tell you several instances in, in my experience where I saw someone who was so hardened against God in a matter of months, his face literally softened as he learned to accept who Jesus was and what Jesus could do for him. Saw that more than once. But the reality is, we seldom win people to this church. We, I mean, we often when people to this church who already knew Jesus, we just added to their understanding. And that's okay. But I want to share some statistics with you. And I know this, this first slide is, is going to be kind of small. And, and so I'm going to read it a, a little bit more. But you can see the numbers. And the numbers are what's important. George Barna, who's now with the American World, the Cultural Research Center, in 2023 did a, a survey. And he surveyed people as to what they believed about what he considers a biblical worldview, which we can agree with. Now, there's nine things here because two of them are divided up. But there's seven parts to the worldview. And the first one, he says, what, what, how many people, what percentage of people disagree that we can determine moral truth and that we need to and that there, there uh, is moral truth that applies to everyone. And he says 25% of all adults, 25% of all adults disagree that there's moral truth. That's Christian and non together. And then he shows the Catholics, evangelicals, and mainline. And if you're not surprised by that statistic, you should be. I want you to notice some, the opposite. If you were to put it in the positive, how many believe that you can determine moral truth and there's absolute truth to be known, only 75% said that they believe that. And so if we were to go out and evangelize people and tell them, let me tell you the truth, they're going to look at you and say, that's your truth. It's not mine. So how do we do it? I want you to notice the next one. Only 23% of adults in America today believe that the best indicator of a successful life is consistent obedience to God. And look at even among Christians, Catholic, Evangelical, Mainline, it's less than 50%. 
Notice the next one. The universal purpose of life for all people is to wholeheartedly know, love, and serve God. With the exception of evangelicals, it's right around a third to 40%. Or, or look at the next one. People are born into sin and can only be saved by its consequences by Jesus Christ. Just 27% of all adults believe that. Or when you have to decide right and wrong source of guidance, you're most likely to, to rely on the Bible. 32%, and that includes Christians. So it would be less than that, even in the, those who don't profess Christianity. Human life is sacred. Only 29% of adults in America believe that. You see the percentages for the, for the uh, other Christian groups. 35% for Catholics, 41% for evangelicals, and 39% for mainly Christians, mainline Christians. The Bible is the true word of God that has no errors. Now this is kind of a, an anomaly. 46% said they believe that. 56% of Catholics, 70% of evangelicals, and 61% of mainline, but yet the percentages are far lower than that as to whether there's absolute truth or not. The next, the, the, the next one, God is the all-powerful, all-knowing, perfect, just creator in the universe, and he rules that universe today. 50% of adults believe in God, and the percentage is even higher for those who are Christians, and yet... They don't want to hear from his word what he says to be true. And finally, after death, you will go to heaven. We know how people can interpret that. Only because you confessed your sins and have accepted Jesus as your Savior. Just 35% of the adults in America believe that, including Christians. 31% of Catholics, 66% of evangelicals, and 46% of mainline Christians. Is that daunting or what? Let me give you something even more daunting. The number of biblical worldview cornerstones accepted by American adults. Those biblical worldview co cornerstones we just looked at. We can agree with all of them with maybe a slight inter interpretation of one. But I want you to notice the number of, of uh, who accept the worldwide view who are adults, who believe all seven of those are just 3%. And then it divides it up by ages, and it's not very large. The number who believe in four to six of those seven biblical world, worldview cornerstones is only 20%. The number who believe in one to three of them is 57%. And the number who believe in none of them is 20%. Those should be figures that creates a solemnity in our hearts, shouldn't they? We have been given the task of sharing the gospel, the good news of salvation with a world who needs to know God and to follow him. If they don't believe the Bible actually teaches what truth is, we're not going to win them by pointing to the Bible and saying, let me tell you what you should do. Let me tell you what you should believe. Let me tell you what's really right. We've got to start in another place. And the younger the people we're dealing with are, the more prominent those are. And by the way, those statistics about adults is probably even less in California than it is in other states of the Union. So, how do we bring people to Jesus in a culture that does not know and maybe doesn't want to know because they have their own truth? I think there's only one way. And that's going to take place because of the power of Christians' testimonies. The power of their testimony about who Jesus is, who God is, and what God's like, and what God has done for you, how you've seen him operate in your life. What is interesting, 
the Apostle Paul in the book of Acts, his testimony of how he came to Christ is shared three times. Are you aware of that? The first time was when Dr. Luke was writing about how Paul came to become a Christian, telling the actual story. The second time was in Acts 22, when Paul was brought before a Roman tribunal because there was a riot because people thought he had brought a Gentile into the temple. And as he's standing before the, the Roman soldiers there, he gives his own testimony of what happened on the Damascus Road. And then in Acts chapter 26, in Acts chapter 26, he tells the story of his conversion when he's standing before Agrippa facing life and death. And his only answer to a pagan king, a pagan ruler, is let me tell you what Jesus has done for me. But that's not the only place Paul tells his testimony. And it just, I hadn't quite seen this until this week. In every letter almost of Paul, Paul shares his personal testimony in ways that are appropriate with the message he's trying to give. Let me give you one example. In the book of Philippians, Paul is speaking against legalism. And it's in that book that he starts out and he says, listen, I know what legalism's like. As to the law, I was perfect. I was a Hebrew among Hebrews. I kept the law perfectly. I, I, I did everything right, but I counted all that as garbage for the sake of knowing Jesus Christ. You read his letters and it's, it's almost woven in his own testimony of what God had done for him or through him or what God was doing in his own life. And we wonder sometimes why Paul's letters are so powerful. I think it's because he's woven his own testimony into that, into those letters. Because they became real. They become real when we read them. John the Apostle had much the same. I want you to notice what it says in 1 John 1, 1 to 4. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have touched, concerning the word of life. The life was revealed, and we have seen and testified to it, and announced to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was revealed to us. We declare to you that which we have seen and heard, that you also may have fellowship with us, and our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We are writing these things to you so that our joy may be complete. Now, I can hear someone saying, but okay, let's talk about the apostles and John, and they actually saw Jesus, and they touched Jesus, and they heard Jesus, and they saw the miracles. We haven't done that. Oh, yes, you have. You may not have touched Jesus physically, but when you've studied your word and when you've prayed, you have touched Jesus. When you've seen answers to prayer, he has touched you. When you've read the word, you have seen Jesus. When you see someone else and you see God at work in their life, you've seen the Spirit at work. You see, both John and Paul are not living in a nice little Christian enclave. They're living in a world that, that really rejects God. They're living in a pagan world that has other gods, and so are we. They're just not idols that people bow down to. There are other things. And so, in both Paul and in John, we see the power of testimony. And I can just hear some of you say, well, that's, that's good for them, but, you know, I'm not a pastor. I can't give a testimony. I, I'm not an elder in the church. I, I can't share Bible texts. I'm not even a deacon. I'm not sure I could even pick up the offering. But, but I want you to notice a, a statement that Ellen White makes in the book Steps to Christ. She says, No sooner does one come to Christ than there is born in his or her heart a desire to make known to others what a precious friend he has found in Jesus. The saving and sanctifying truth cannot be shut up in his heart if we are clothed with the righteousness of Christ and are filled with the joy of his indwelling spirit. We shall not be able to hold our peace. If we have tasted and seen that the Lord is good, we shall have something to tell. What keeps us, and let's be honest, 
I think it's hard for most of us to share our testimony with other people. What keeps us from sharing our faith? What keeps us from giving our testimony? I think there's a list of things I've heard throughout my time as a pastor. I think the number one thing that keeps us from sharing our faith or testimony is downright fear. What if they reject me? The truth is they don't reject you, they reject Jesus. What if they misunderstand what I'm trying to tell them? What if I explain it to them and they still don't get it? There's the Holy Spirit who can make it sink in later on. What happens if I fail? I don't say the right words. I don't remember the right text. I, 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 my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. What happens if, if they don't accept? Fear. That's why Paul calls us to come boldly and to speak boldly for Christ. It takes boldness. I think another thing that keeps people from sharing their faith in Jesus is some people say, I don't have a conversion story. I grew up in the church. I've always believed in Jesus. I don't have a story to tell. Oh, yes, you do. I grew up in the church too. Because of what I learned and taught and what I heard about Jesus, I was never tempted to do drugs or, or drink alcohol. Because I grew up in the church and I, I, I had faith in Jesus, I was never tempted to steal. B because I grew up in the church, the pattern of my life was set in a way that kept me from danger and kept me from getting in trouble. Do you, do you understand what I'm saying? You do have a story to tell. You can tell how God has kept you all your life. Others will say, I don't have an exciting testimony. I'm not like someone who was on drugs and God delivered them from them. And we need to hear those testimonies. I'm not putting them down. But we tend to think that my testimony is so small that nobody's going to really see anything valued in it. The greatest testimony of all is the testimony of how God is transforming your life and entering into your life in a meaningful way. Some people say, I don't have the, the chance to. I think many of the reasons why we don't share our testimony or our faith in God is we're not looking for opportunities to do it. We're not intentional. A number of years back, I started praying every day, God, in every interaction today, whether it's with family, friends, whether it's on the phone, help me to recognize how I can be your hands and feet to that person I'm with. It takes intentionality. It takes awareness. And some days I look back and say, where, was, where did that happen, God? And then I go, oh, okay. <laughs> I missed it. But that's okay. You can always call them back or see them at another time and tell them, you know, I've been thinking about what we talked about. And let me just share with you something. The very least you can do is offer to pray with them. But we're reticent to do that even. I have never found anyone who didn't want me to pray. Even people who had no faith in God, when they were going through a difficult time, if I say, can I pray with you, they'll say yes. A really big one is, I'm an introvert. I, I, I don't, I'm not an extrovert. I can't, I can't do it. I've seen so many introverts at sporting events going out of their skin to root for their team. It'll happen tomorrow. I've seen so many introverts who, when they were given a birthday present or a present or they landed a, new, a, new, a raise at the job, they were just as extroverted as you could be. Do, do you get my point? We become extroverts when something meaningful happens to us. I've heard people say, I don't have the gifts or skills. I would remind you of two things. Number one, it's God who gives the gifts. And he gives it to those not before they start serving, but he gives it to those who are involved in serving others. And he gives them gifts they never dreamt they could do. And finally, what keeps us from sharing our faith is that we have a lukewarm relationship with God. And that may be the biggest one. So, how do we share our testimony? 
I want to remind you of two truths that we looked at last week. The first one is, what is a disciple? A disciple is someone who desires to be with Jesus and becomes like, who desires to become like Jesus and who wants to do what Jesus did, to serve others out of compassion and mercy and love. I would remind you of the second truth, that our faith is personal, but it is not private. People are watching what we do, and it should not be private in what we say. We moved into our home in Rancho Bernardo in 2020, December. And across the street, a neighbor and his wife went over and met them, found out his wife had muscular dystrophy. Offered to pray with him, they let me. Not too terribly long after that, he saw him in the yard. How you doing, Jim? He said, not so good. My wife's been diagnosed with dementia, perhaps Alzheimer's. Prayed with him about that. Not too long after that, he, he told me that he had to put her in a, a facility that could care for her. A few weeks ago, saw him, said, Jim, how's it going? He says, it's tough. By the way, I've given him some books on grief as well. He says, it's been tough. He says, sometimes I feel so guilty that I'm not taking care of my wife. I said, I get that. I get that. Would you really be able to give her the attention she needs if she were in your home? You can probably give her more meaningful love and attention by going and visiting her than you could if you were caring for her the whole time. We talked. I offered to pray again. He said yes. Tears in his eyes after the prayer. We talked and chatted a little bit more. I can't tell you that he's become a Seventh-day Adventist. I know he hasn't. But I can tell you that was a God encounter. The rest is up to God. The rest is up to God. He meets people where they are. I want to remind you of what the passage in Corinthians says. We have this treasure in jars of clay. In your jar of clay, in the rut and routine of your life, you carry with you the treasure of the knowledge of the light of God's glory in the face of Jesus. You have this treasure. I can hear some of you saying, I wouldn't know what to say about my testimony. Let me tell you two things about that. One, you can tell a story of when you were converted or how you came to know Jesus. Everyone can tell that. But as you're listening and interacting with people, you can hear what they're going through and ask God to give you the words to say to them at that moment. It is when we have that kind of testimony that then people will come to us and say, I want what you have. I want what you have. At this time, I'm going to ask the, the deacons to pass out a sheet. It's two pages. It's tips on how to prepare a personal testimony. Because if we never think about what our testimony is, we may not realize how powerful our testimony can be. Secondly, as if you do this, you may be surprised at looking back on your life to see the places where God was present and you didn't even realize it. My challenge, the challenge for all of us, even though it's scary, the challenge for all of us is for us to have an intentionality, to be intentional that every day we pray, God, help me to be your spokesperson today. Help me to be the ambassador that you need in, with the, among the people I, I live with, people I work with, people I encounter, and even people in the supermarket. I was in the su supermarket this week, and I was getting something, and I saw the badge on the, on the gentleman's shirt, and I called him by name. And his eyes lit up, and he said, thank you for calling me by name. Now, I had a cheat sheet. 
I haven't done really well at remembering all your names, and I apologize for that. But the truth is, just being aware, I didn't tell him I was a Christian. I didn't tell him, he, but the fact that he lit up, the Holy Spirit can use that as he chooses. And so I would challenge you. I hope you just don't take this piece of paper home and throw it to the side. I challenge you, write out your own testimony. You'd be surprised looking back to see what God has done.